Welcome to Talking In Stations. This is Matt Earl. Uh, we're going to talk about EVE Online today. I'm here with Rundle. Hello, everyone. Hi, Matt Earl. Hey. Uh, we're also here with Abby Rova. Hey, how you doing? Good. All right. Both these guys are uh, part of TIS. Uh, it, it, we're basically a think tank. I think if I describe Talking In Stations, it's kind of a think tank of advanced players that um, are... Uh, people who've been around this game a long, long time. And there is a wealth of information in just about every member of TIS. They're specifically recruited and picked out. And there is uh, an interview process with me to kind of feel out, like, is this a good fit or not? Some people are new, but a lot of people have been around a good long time. And they may be known to you. They may be unknown to you but they're all incredibly valuable. That's the TIS team. There's about 45 of us. So when I say from TIS, it doesn't mean that they're um, uh, necessarily a member of our staff, but they are part of the think tank group that we uh, draw on for our knowledge. And that's, that's how we've kind of built this place. It's a, it's a group that talks in stations, basically. Okay, uh, today we are going to talk a little bit about war, but there's really just a series of Fortizars that are being destroyed. Most of those are in M2. Four of the, say, seven Fortizars from the Imperium that are being destroyed sometime today. A lot of them are probably already destroyed. We're in M2, so that was kind of interesting. There were some skirmishes around 1DQ. There was a gate camp that was attacked in 1DQ by Pappy. Uh, it might have been a test to see kind of what the defense structure is like. Um, what we can we can discuss some of that. Not not a lot going on though in this war. We're in a we're in a three week grind phase. It looks like where a lot of structures might be under attack. Uh, I think we have a couple keep stars coming out before the end of the week. Uh, and the Imperium on their side of things, there may be some support for what dread bomb that's attacking. Um, the east where legacy was from there might be uh some well actually they lost a group i think probably to snuff looks like pnf smashes group black is it black omega um they may be they're headed away from imperium that's kind of bad news for them but uh, the imperium is right now probably resting very comfortably in 1dq there's no threat to them they're way too powerful to take right now there's no real attempt to do anything to them anyway. But they are seeing systems around them go undefended. Uh, and I think that's part of their plan. So I don't really know what's going on with the Imperium, what their strategy is necessarily, except for maybe wait until the final siege, the final assault. Uh, I think as far as I'm concerned, I've been hearing from uh, people in the Imperium, what I I generally get a sense that they don't really want to think about the war because their their mind is kind of elsewhere. That's kind of what's going yep. on. Yep. What do you think? Uh, elitist ops, I think, is what you're thinking of. Thank you, with, Black uh, Omega. Somebody yep. else. Yeah, yeah. Black Omega uh, and, is Suaz, I think, but Elitist Ops is uh, pan, uh, Penis Smash. Yeah, and I think we were talking about this the other night. You know, are mm -hmm. they having fun? And I, you know, there was uh, I dropped in on uh, another show sometimes uh talking uh trash talk tuesday which i enjoy great show um after this so it doesn't collide with uh with that but uh there's a a good mix of imperium and pappy and others on there and kind of what i was saying where you know if you're pvp oriented and you enjoy fights then you're having fun and then there's some other people who are like i'm just tired of talking about the war i just want to go back and do some of the other things and so I think it really depends on what it is you enjoy doing. And actually, I think that's across both sides. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not just an Imperium situation. Certainly, I see that even on the Pappy side, which I didn't. we didn't really talk about that the other day. Um, I'm on, you know, from one of those uh, legacy groups that was in the East where Dreadbomb kind of came in. And, you know, we're moving and we know where we're going and we're doing all that stuff. But certainly there has been, you know, you have to lead and manage the 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 group to help all the players that make up your group, industrialists, miners, um, you know, people who just want to rat and do, do whatever, um, certainly have had to work at it. And that is not unique to, um, to just Imperium, um, mm -hmm. but Pappy, both sides have had to do it. So 
Yeah, it's a long war. It's a, it's a super long war. Okay, there's a couple yep. of things I want to get to today as well. One is I'll show you how I did on the mining competition that I joined uh, over the last weekend over there with DamFam. Uh, and then it's something really special that we're going to preview because it's not complete. Uh, Abby, we were, Abby and I were talking earlier and he showed me some work that he had done, some uh, com computation on the Silk Road, which uh, was it myth or is it real? And we'll have a look at what that that might be like. So I'm cool. uh, very excited about that. Okay. Um, first, I want to start with, so I think four, four Dazars are going down in M2 today. And you know about M2 because yep. tell us why. Because I was hanging out there, you know, at a safe spot in my carrier with a, you know, cargo full of uh, exotic dancers for the last <laughs> 10, for the last 10 weeks. Basically, I was in that very first battle uh, at the bottom of the keep start. And I don't know, about two o'clock in the morning, uh, I crashed. And I was like, I'm just going to bed. And, uh, you know, it's safe logged. I didn't get a kill mail, so I was fine. Logged in the next day and watched and watched and watched. I think I actually watched uh, like with rain chocolate and we were just watching, watching. And the whole top thing happened with all the, you know, round two of the Titans. And the call never came in to log in at the bottom location. And then the next day the hell camp started. And I haven't logged in to Rundle um, for basically 10 weeks until today. So all right. real talk, what did it feel like to be stuck there? Yeah, real talk. It, it honestly really uh, kind of sucked. It was a little bit annoying. Uh, it, they certainly um, broke my style of play. I was playing a lot more hours, uh, and some of that had to do with the fact that it was, uh, you know, and you know, Christmas time and stuff. But uh, you know, I kind of have an ebb and a flow to what I do on what character and what time and PvP. And Rundle is my primary PvP character, and I really love PvP. So I was struggling to log into my alts, which maybe didn't have the right doctrine. And I'm you know, trying to bring all that up to speed and handle a bit of a move. And then, you know, the dread bomb thing kind of happened over in our area, which caused me to kind of have to, to, you know, hustle and, and move the, a few things around on some characters. The and, dread bomb thing is what? Uh, so they have, they are basically attacking the East. So that's the group, uh, the group dread bomb. Not that's the, right. The, okay. Group of dead, group dead bomb, not the activity. And so they're, they've been putting some pressure um, on, on the east. And uh, I was over in that area with some of my alts, and so I had to kind of move some stuff. And, of course, I have some stuff for Rundles there, and I'm like, well, I guess I can't do anything about it because I'm off in space. Uh, I can't do much about it. So there's you know, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of uh, just, uh, you know, that gut punch every time. Uh, I can't use Rundle. Uh, I can't use Rundle. And so it was dragging on, but at the same time, in a real talk, there was a little bit of, you know, it'll end. And in a way, I was kind of doing my part. Now, I didn't bring it up. I didn't talk about it ever because why? Like, it's just going to add stress on my side and add stress to the players. And it's just going to sound like spin anyway. So um, I was I was fine. I was, ultimately, at the end of the day, I was fine with it. I'm really happy today to get back into, uh, you know, into my ship and, and get back to the station. You probably hear it in my voice. So, yeah. you know, I think I'm on the upswing now. Um, yeah, so real talk, it, it did impact me, it didn't impact my play. Um, and that's what happens in war, and I was asked to do something in the game. I did. Um, the Imperium responded um, beautifully and kept me out of the game, and I wasn't able to participate. So, you know, check mark on that part. Is there something they could have done, do you think, to, I don't know, drive you further out? Like M2 was demoralizing for you, as you just expressed. Like, is there anything they could have done to further push you out of the game or push you out of contention? Uh, you know, for Rundle, I'm, no, because, uh, well, you know, if, if I really think about it, if they had put pressure on um, T5Z, for example, massive pressure and really kept me camped and then basically attacked, you know, that where I have some assets. Um, of course, you spread your assets around, but you know you would think I had some assets there, which of course would be correct. Now, if they had attacked both, and now I'm like, well, I'm I'm out of the game, and my assets are going off to some asset safety, and I might have been like, ah, probably gonna, you know, short of finding my account and deleting the character, you're probably not gonna get me out of the game. But um, it certainly would have been like, ah, I got to find a different way to play this game. And probably would have forced me over on my alts even further. Yeah, 
was trying to think of what they could have done that when they had you trapped, like what could they have done? I thought maybe a bold move. I think five taxi might have been too bold, but because I would have been pretty rough, but they could have attacked maybe YZ9. I don't know, like something big, but I, I didn't know what they could do with how they could capitalize on that because once they lost the iHub, I felt like, well, they got to get that back. And the result of losing that iHub is what we see right now, which is losing control of the system. And so now you have four Fortas are being destroyed there. The camp is over. It didn't really amount to much except kind of keep you tied up there while Helm's Deep burned. You know, so it kind of ends up working against them. I didn't see it at the time. It wasn't something that I predicted either. But uh, it, it does seem like not a really good return on the M2. You got you got that really big win, um, and I was trying to think of what they could do that would that would be uh, yeah. I, know, I, I really don't. On it, I guess. Uh, other than just continue doing what they were doing and keep me out of the game. I mean, my only option. I really was considering it. Quite frankly, my only option was well, maybe I just log in and and whelp this uh, capital ship. Do you ever think of I, taking the ticket or the no, I don't think what you, you have to be out a long time before you know, it's like nine it's like uh over three months or is it six months or something you have to be out. Oh no, I mean, mean the ticket. No, 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 the golden ticket or the silver ticket or the Willy Wonka meme that Oh no, no, no. Like that ever cross your mind? No, not not even <laughs> enough. No. Okay, we're back. It uh, looks like uh one of our tools decided to do a restart there, so sorry. My uh, my story was too much for it to handle. <laughs> I thought, you know. You're, my but, joy, my excitement, <laughs> overload, excitement overload. Take us back to the top of that one. Yeah. All right. So I think what I was talking about was uh, really the only thing that I seriously was considering on how to end it for me, uh, <laughs> say it that way, was to literally just, you know, screw it. I'm going to log in. I'm just going to whelp this capital ship and take the loss. Um the only thing that really kept me from doing that was, nope, not going to give them satisfaction. I will sit in space for as long as I need to sit in space. That really was my only debate. Uh, and so I really think to answer your question of what else could they have done to really crush me was just keep me there. The longer I sat there, the longer it was, you know, I, I really was considering more frequently, uh, maybe I'll just give them the kill. Maybe I'll just give them the kill. Um, but that was really it. But you'd rather give them the kill than the sale because it's a little more honorable, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Because at least, I, you know, I, maybe I could, maybe I could slip up. Maybe I could take someone with me. Maybe I could escalate a fight. Maybe I could force something else. Yeah. Um, and so, as you know, in the first early days, there was, I wasn't even considering that because that was just straight up suicide. But as things progressed over time, and there's different fleets going on and, and different opportunities. Um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to, to do something different or cause something to escalate. Like, I don't know, had I known, for example, that the whole double vendetta thing was going on, for example, like what if I had logged in at that moment and just sent some fighters out and, uh, got on a kill mail while I was getting killed at the same time? Like, okay. Like as, as it progressed, there was more opportunity to maybe do something, but, Again, I just chose not to do anything and, and not even um, create a, a situation. I really just wanted to kind of stay on the, yeah, it impacted me personally as a pilot and as a player, but it didn't impact the overall um, war effort at the end of the day. So uh, Lava Kano asks, funny name actually for Iceland right now. It's going through a bunch of earthquakes and a volcano eruption. That <laughs> yeah. we have. It's uh, appropriate. Uh, he asks, who was the only person that took the ticket? Uh, I actually don't know if anybody took the ticket. There was a, a brave guy that uh, appeared in public and was saying, like, I'd like to take the ticket. And there's something about him that was a little bit sketchy. Like, uh, there was uh, something he wasn't allowed in the – he wasn't in the capital group for uh, Legacy. So that's kind of weird. So he probably wasn't – uh, a trusted enough member to be in that, or I don't know what, but it was something, it wasn't just a brave guy. It was a brave guy with like some sketchiness to him. And then there was a second, I think it was a meme on Reddit saying, Oh, did that first guy take the ticket? Cause I'd be interested in it too. And I'm sure that was not real, or at least it seemed like it was so publicly fake. Uh, so I don't know if anybody took the ticket. Uh, one of the criticisms was that it was, it was at first it was really funny and, and 
comical and kind of a neat idea. And it was the, you know, Willy Wonka, we can, you can buy your way out. But I think what was telling about it was it became very meme and a little bit, uh, I, I don't know, it became a little bit meme which tells me it wasn't really working as an actual strategy. So you might as well get the comedy out of it. And that's what I think leaders will do is if they'll put an offer out there and it's like, will you, will you take my hand or whatever? And then if uh, the partner doesn't take your hand, then you kind of make fun of the occasion that you were just kidding anyway. And so I think that that's kind of what this turned into. So it makes me think just psychologically that it wasn't that nobody was taking that ticket. Uh, and I'm, I'm with Rundle. I think if I were in, in the same situation, probably I would want to, I would want to go out uh, and die and lose the uh, Titan as opposed to turn it over in some really embarrassing way. Yeah, well, I, anyway. I wasn't in a Titan, so I'll be clear. I wasn't in a Titan <laughs> okay. or, or even a super cap. So I really wasn't talking about a lot of money, but I still didn't want to. Oh, dude. Still didn't want to do it. Yeah, just blow that thing up and get on a vendetta kill. All right. Um, thanks. Sorry, can I just ask? Um, yeah, I was about. Go ahead. You were stuck there for two months and, and you slowly started to think about cracking. How long do you think it would have been before you finally just logged the thing in and whelped it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, I, I think honestly a couple of weeks ago I was seriously considering it. Um, but when there seemed to be some momentum change, there were some bubbles, there was a bit of a breakout, there started to be um, some cracks forming on the hell camp. And, and I, saw, I started seeing that uh, Pappy was taking advantage of that. I think that stemmed the tide. Had they, where I was at probably about week six or week seven, if that had just continued, um, probably right around now, I probably would have maybe even a couple more weeks at max. I would have just said, all right. Cause, I mean, let's be honest. I'm, I'm in a, just a normal cap ship. We're talking about a couple billion uh I could have solved that. Um, it wasn't like we're talking, you know, 10, 12, 15, 100 billion isk of any sorts. Uh, yeah, it was close. Uh, in real talk, it was it was pretty close. Um, but right. a couple of weeks ago, their t- things started changing. So, um, yeah, good question. Yeah, no, I like it. It's kind of like, I don't want to be too dramatic, but, you know, if your buddy beside you in the trench is holding the line, you're more likely to hold the line and, and that keeps the morale up and that's going to keep you holding longer while, you know, as you said, if things continue to go bad, that that uh, that logging in and whelping it does just look more inviting, doesn't it? Yep, yep, it does. And, uh, you know, I was talking with people around me. It's actually a really good point because I was talking with, you know, people in my uh, in my alliance and, and other people in Legacy and get on comms every once in a while, play on my alt and, hey, you know, uh, what's going on? Hey, what are you going to do? Uh, hey, uh, who's in? Who's out? Who's still stuck? And then there's like this little group of us who are like, yep, I'm still stuck. I'm still stuck. And we're just, like you said, holding the line. We're just going to hold the line. It was that bit of mentality, but the cracks were forming even on ours. I know one guy uh, asked, screw it's just a fax. And he logged in and the fax is dead. And he just said, I, I got to have my pilot back. So they were starting. It was starting for sure. Yeah, I've had it um, before in wormholes a lot more, um, where you are might be trapped in a wormhole or lost, or you end up in null sec and it's 50 jumps from home and you don't have any filaments, and you're like, God, how much is this shit worth to my time? <laughs> yeah. I have a, I have at least a, a, plenty of alts. I put some energy there. I was doing some production and working on my other uh, alt to get, uh, I reworked a training skill to get into some doctrine ships and was playing around a little bit. and. I wasn't completely out of touch. It's just, yeah, this character in this situation. All right. Well, uh, Seth Winter actually tells us, yes, a brave Leviathan logged in. Was it a Ragnarok? Leviathan. It was Leviathan, I suppose. Um, and not sure how legitimate it was, but the Le- the Levy was logged in and escorted out of the bubbles. So uh, that did happen. Not necessarily sure what what the implications were of that. So maybe somebody did actually say, you know what, I want to get out of this situation, take my ship, I'll take some money. Uh, it wasn't full price, apparently. Um, at least that's what they were. They were offering less than full price. And the person got out of the situation that you were in with a less expensive ship. But uh, interesting, all the psychology goes on with how much is enough. How much, how demoralizing was M2 is what I was trying to get at. 
like how much was that advantage really uh, for the Imperium and could they have done anything to take it you know a bit further excellent question Abby let's actually um, talk about this is big news it's not quite revealed yet I mean it is revealed but it's not quite thought through but let's go to peanut of smashes group is uh, what was it Elita stops right yeah that's right Elitist up. Oh, what are they called? Uh, there it is. Ah. Israd, that's right. Uh, I don't know if this is the right one, but uh, I think it is. Check Alliance history. They were in Oh God. So this one is. Not complete, I don't think. Let's try that again. That's them, but. You can you can search for mad cows, <laughs> one of their pilots. Oh, there it is, okay. Yeah, I just hit the one with the dot. Here it is. Okay, it thanks. Is. Yeah, okay, so this is the group Lions History. You'll see they've been in uh, Goon Swarm where they started. And uh, they went to Band of Brothers, Pandemic Legion. They recently, see, now we jump to 2018, because they were in PL for eight years. Then they went to Snuffed Out for a bit, went to Volta. Trigger Happy was a, a really quick stay, I believe, yeah. Uh, went back to Volta and ended up in Goon Swarm when this war began. Uh, and these guys are actually the guys that own the Goon Swarm name uh, that they recently just lost, which was kind of funny timing because they're in the news for two different things. That being one of them. The second thing being that they're leaving Goon Swarm. As you can see, their uh, date for leaving was the 9th. So they are out. Where they end up is still unknown because uh, it hasn't been recorded yet. Rumors are that they will go to uh, Snuffed Out, back to Snuffed Out again, or maybe to Volta. Uh, but not sure where they're going to end up necessarily. That's a, it's kind of a big loss for the Imperium because these guys are very good at what they do. And what they do is assassinate capital ships, super capital ships. When they were a part of Pandemic Legion, uh, they were able to bait out one of uh, Goon Swarm's best FCs, um, J amazingness and not only bait out his titan but bait out his um super carrier his faction super carrier uh are, and, are you saying they're master baiters <laughs> i believe that's the correct term yeah. so. <laughs> just checking <laughs> that's, that's, all right um uh, and so they were able to draw them out and take advantage of the situation with dread bombs and just annihilate them. This is in the beginning. This is one of the, the early kills that was a stunning shock to uh, the Imperium when they were in Delve because they had built this, they were building at the time, this umbrella of protection for their area. And this was the one attack that kind of sent a shockwave through that. Uh, and I think they changed some policies after that, if I'm not mistaken, they tightened it up and had incredible success after that for years. Uh, so, that same group here, Elita Stops, ended up later breaking off from Pandemic Legion to do more whale hunting, as they call it, right? You take on these very big and expensive, slow ships, and uh, you bait them and trap them and destroy them. And it takes basically a SWAT team to do that. And that's what these guys are like. So that's what Elita Stops is. So when they join, joined Goon Swarm for the beginning of this war... Uh, I don't know if there was any kind of political message to it, uh, but as you can see, they'd kicked around in low sec for a little while uh, before joining uh, Goon Swarm. So it was a big plus for them. And uh, I think these guys engineered a few kills, a few big kills uh, against Pappy while they were there. And uh, so now they're taken off. I don't know exactly why. But they're leaving on good terms. We do know that. 
Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. It's definitely on good terms. It's an amicable separation. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Vili reminds us there was a revenant that was killed on the pappy side of things recently in T5Z, right? It's a, it should have been protected, but it was able to uh, to get caught and destroyed, and that was uh, Peen of Smash and his crew of Elitist Ops. So yeah, they, they did. They, they spent a bunch of time in T5Z as well, just kind of like a harassment crew moving around gate camping, camping the station, camping people who were accidentally warping here or there. I mean, they were on their toes all the time and participating in local, uh, I'll just leave it as that, participating in local and you know, just harassing and doing their job, um, which I, I believe really in talking with uh, some of them, that, that really was their job. That's what they liked doing. And they did it really well. They were really good. Okay, so let's take a quick look at Z Killboard. Not S Killboard, but Z. I remember, I was. I have to make fun of myself every time because I have one of these fancy keyboards with no letters on the keys, and uh, I don't know how to type, so I have to use. <laughs> I have to look. So anyway, um, the wrong keyboard for the wrong person. Let's look at the ten billion or more. I think this actually. Uh, we'll see some Fortizars here that are lighting up, as you can tell. Uh, yeah, Goonsworm Federation. This is 1DH, uh, a faction Fortizar taken out. It belonged to Goonsworm as well. BX2, that's Inquarius. Uh, here's the M2 series. So we have uh, Fortizar in M2. And, and yesterday, I guess, or no, actually, right about now, another uh, Fortizar in M2. We think within the next few hours, there'll be a total of four in M2. So you can see Fortizars are going down. Yeah, so, I, so if someone who uh, is on the Z Killboard staff is listening, you guys should like toss Matterall a, a free subscription so he doesn't have any ads. <laughs> Just saying. He uses it all the time. No, I did. I paid for the thing, but it didn't take it away. I think maybe because I paid with a different account or something. Different account, okay. Yeah, but I, I did pay the uh, the Patreon thing. That just didn't work out. Just, and oh, everybody I use the in-game ISK. I do the uh, ISK subscription where I, you pay ISK and uh, you, know, you kind of give them an ISK donation sort of thing. That's how I do mine. Yeah, well, everybody should support Z Killboard. It does a great service uh, for people. Yes, totally. That was the real point. Yeah. Z Killboard is a really good place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, let's go to, do you want to share your screen, Abby, so we can talk about? Uh, uh, I actually just sent you a link if, in a message. That works. Okay, let me grab it. Oh, I need access. Why don't I request access? Oh, access request. Sure. Sure. Let's see. Seconds. Oh, in the meantime, while you send me that link or approve me for that link, let's talk about damn fam mining competition results by players. Here's your list of winners. At the top spot was uh, Igneous Tempus. In the second spot was Shin Apol. And third was Roar On Guard. Fourth was our boy uh, Astraeus Khan. I shouldn't call him boy, he's a man. So our man Astraeus Khan. And uh, I am off the charts because I didn't turn in my winnings. So I competed in this. I was probably, since there were 19 competitors, I was probably 20th. Uh, but the amount of mining that was done in one day was uh, downtime to downtime on Sunday was, uh, volume was a 6.4 million. In That's astounding. Cubed. That's astounding. That's yeah. just. One day of mining. Is that just, yeah. So from downtime to downtime, one ship, one guy, right? I don't know about one ship. I think it might have been, I don't know what the rules were. I was in one ship, but I think they might have been crew. Like if you had, I don't think they were in, uh, I am not sure if it was just one person or one effort per person. I believe it was, so if you had 10 alts, you'd only count as one person because it's my 10 alt, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't divide it up by odds. They divided it up by actual human players. Gotcha. So that human player did 6.4 million meters cubed of ore. Yeah, so he could have had like 10 coveters and an orca or two. Yeah. But that's his Either capability. Way, 
Either way, I mean, scarcity is is clearly necessary. I think we can all agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is in high sec. Yeah, exactly. This is in high sec. Yeah. And number two there, uh, Shin, he did three million. And uh, that's astounding numbers. Yeah, and Khan, he he couldn't even get in at the beginning of downtime, so he got you know he had real life that kept popping up on him. He was very frustrated when he finally got there. So he got in really late, and he's still able to pull in a 1.7 million. So these guys are very good miners. Yeah, when I when I go into belts by myself, uh, and I'm looking at these numbers, and I'm thinking, okay, what does my orca hold? Uh, and I look at these numbers, I'm like 10 ish, and I think about like the the amount that's on line 10, you know, the 400k sort of thing. I think how long that takes me to do that. Um, and that 6.4 is astounding. 6.4 million is astounding. It's crazy. Well, uh, one last look at the damn fam guys. Oh, um, <clears throat> I think this is the damn fan uh, competition by corporations, and we should list this out as well. And so first was Hydra, the ancient one. And second place yeah, was uh, Sariano Planetary Goods Distribution. And third was Toad Sprockets. <laughs> just that uh, just for a uh, reference that 6.5 is a little over 16 full freighters oh my god it's amazing mining capability okay let's look at your chart here what should we look at first market trade? uh yeah scroll over to the right of it on that uh, on that page there you go Um, do you want to give some backstory to this? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I don't know how far to take it, but as you know, for those, I think we have some people actually that are interested in EVE Online, but don't know the game that well. So I'm going to speak in very general terms for them just to bring them up to speed. In, uh, in EVE Online, we had some, uh, ancient, uh, relatives of humans, uh, known as Triglavians come in to um, our whole map system and start to attack some systems that were protected by empire space, these empires, uh, again, that are the current day humans. And in doing so, they managed to kidnap or take away uh, certain systems into its own region. So they basically uh, consumed systems and took them into like, let's just say a third dimension. So they can be reached, but not through the normal pathways that they could before. So that whole region left holes basically and broke connections between systems. And one of those major connections was between two major trade hubs. That is the Jita trade hub and the Amarian trade hub, uh, so, uh, when that happened, it created the need to go uh, through alternative routes to, you know, deliver goods from one trade hub to the other. And in doing so, it created what we call the Silk Road. And the Silk Road is, let me see if I can actually find uh, the Silk Road while we talk about it. But the Silk Road, we thought, might... Uh, take people, let's see, New Eden Silk Road. Let's see if I can find a picture inside this uh, thread as people post it. Yeah, this is going to be the picture. So you can see when the connection was broken, it forced people, let me zoom in so you can see this a bit better. In order to get from the Jita Trade Hub to the Amarian Trade Hub, which used to be nine jumps, uh, you now have to travel like uh, many more than that. And it goes through all the empires, as you can see. So we really like that idea. It was, again, something that we called the Silk Road. And here it is on the map. And uh, yeah, so Jira would be the top main hub. Amara would be number two. Dodixie in the middle is number three. And then Heck and Renz are kind of four and five because right they're here. both in uh, Memnitar space. Yeah. And that's always been the case, but um, what we thought what we thought might happen is that trade would become a lot more regional, and people would actually go to their local market as opposed to going to the downtown market because downtown market was just so out of range. 
but we weren't sure what was happening because Jita's Jita was still a, a juggernaut of commerce. So, uh, Abby, why don't you pick it up from there? Yeah. So, um, I I I always loved the idea of the trade hub, and uh, I I thought it'd be cool if it actually happened. Um, I also know people, so I always kind of presumed pessimistically that trade would concentrate in Jita, and it actually wouldn't spread out to these systems as much. So uh, I set about trying to uh, go through the data to uh, either prove or disprove my theory. Um, the only data that could reliably provide this information would be the uh, monthly economic report. Um, I know Caleb and other people have some issues with the uh, accuracy of the data, but it's the only data we have, so it's the data I began working with. Um, if you want to go uh, back over to the Google spreadsheet, Um, so this chart we're looking at here is, uh, just for reference, when we say dem it's it's by region. So the Amar Trade Hub is in Domain, Dodixi is in Sync Liaison, uh, I always mix the last two up, Heck is in Metropolis, and Renz is in Hematar. Um, so you this is, it. thanks, yeah. <laughs> so this doesn't include the Forge uh, Jita because it's, like 90% of the trade um, and it just makes the graph look ridiculous so and this is kind of rough so here we have as we can see the monthly the market trade value uh, going back to January 2019 up until January 2021 and it shows the percentage of the market value compared to uh, the forge. Sorry, it doesn't. It just shows the actual value. Sorry. So these are the actual. This is the this actual is the value. Yeah. This is the total amount of ISK trading happening in these trade regions. Right. So to that, be clear, you, you've eliminated the forge because it's way off the charts. This is all the other competitors. Yes, and it also it doesn't matter what the forge is because the forge is always going to be that baseline. I want to see how the others compare to the forge, um, and it's also the reason. And it's it's so large; it's the reason why when CCP has the mirror, they have you know a chart with the forge and then a chart without the forge. Yeah, the mirror, by the way, is the M E R, the monthly economic report for every month that it comes out. Um, but one interesting thing from just looking at the total market value traded is we can see there around July and August. There's that dip. And that dip coincides with the invasion of Niarja when the Triglavians were camping the gate and uh, slow traffic traveling between those regions. So there's that event standing out to us uh, almost immediately. Um, if you scroll down a little bit. So this is, this is uh, I think this is kind of the moneymaker here. This is now looking at the total market trading value in these regions compared to the forge uh, as a percentage of the value in that region versus the forge. So if trading was to go down in all these spread out trade regions, we would see this value go down. If trading is spreading out from Jita and the forge into these four trade hubs, we would see this value go up. And as we see on this chart, these values are slowly beginning to trend upwards. Uh, the Amar uh, domain, the blue line, a little bit more than the others. So obviously it is still maintaining its spot as the second largest trade hub and it's growing. Uh, that's an 8 to 12% increase. So I mean, it's grown by 50%. Wow. Um, and Sync Liaison, the red line is growing a little bit. Um, now this, this recent dip could be uh, you know, it, it could be lower trading because of Christmas and the war. Um, it's a little bit too soon to say just yet, but I mean, for the last six months, we've seen these trade hubs grow and grow in trade, grow in volume, grow in percentage, grow in contracts compared to Jita. It's great. Yeah. Can you so, go back a slide? So this is good news, but, uh, well, let's go back for Rundle's question and then, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. and you might've accidentally deleted it or something or moved it. Cool. Huh, whoops. Just try hitting uh, edit undo there. All your work. 
No, I made a specific copy just to give to you. Let's let me move over here. That is weird. Maybe reload the page. Let's try that. Yeah, so here's the question I'll ask if you get the yeah. graph back. Um, you know there was the drop of all the trade based on um, you know, Nigeria going away, and, and you correlated that. But then there was a drop about a year before that. Uh, was that blackout? Do you think that was just the kind of where trade stopped in general? Or is that, maybe that's not, no. that's probably the wrong time. Yeah, I don't think black, I mean. That was, that was three, two years ago, three years ago almost. Okay, I got it back. Thank you. Uh, so, are you talking about the dip between September and October? Of 2019, yep. Yeah. Okay. The one of 2019 that went down to almost the same level as the one in well, July of the past year. So, what happened a year ago? And I have a question. If you, if you know what happened a year ago, uh, over, oh, sorry, two years ago there, that September of 2019. Yeah. I want to look at the next graph after. So, do we know what happened then? That, is, that is blackout, yeah. No, um, and it's also that's what I thought. So you have the um, oh, sorry, where's my point? The change in market sales brokers fees was around that time, yeah, mm -hmm. August 2019. Okay, so now scroll down to the the corresponding percent change, and you see that there really wasn't in September and October. There really wasn't a change in the market. So while there was an overall drop in volume, there wasn't a rush to new markets. And so to me, that gives a direct correlation that it is the additional change of the, of the pathway to the market. Otherwise, you would have seen, seen a complementary rise or fall based just on trade volume. Um, so to me, I'm just kind of using that to validate your analysis and your data. I think this makes that, that case even more. So, um, thank you. Um, I did see that dip in August, September, but I hadn't begun to correlate it to the percentage. Uh, what is very interesting, though, that you pointed out is, uh, Matterall, if you'd like to go to the contract trading volume tab at the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, contracts are kind of all over the place. They're, uh, I rounded this to the nearest kind of quarter of a billion, half billion. But... Uh, if we look there, you can see the amount of contracts went up in August and then spiked down sharply afterwards in September and October. Of that same 2019 period, yes. yeah. Yeah, so they're building up June, July, August, and then they're down September, October, and then they're kind of returning normal. So I think what happened there was a lot of people were changing the contracts for some um, high value items and then once people realized what the changes were and how to work around them um you know people changed their behavior with market orders and weren't updating every 30 seconds people started using contracts maybe a little bit less afterwards but i found it interesting yeah that is interesting um, and you can see if you go to the on the fees and taxes tab next, uh, the very bottom tab. Oh, tab. Okay. So this is uh, brokers fees and transaction tax uh, total take. This is of the the universe. So we can see there. Um, there's that change in July August. That huge uh, jump up. Yeah. That's the change from um, when they changed, like the relisting fees. Um, yeah. So for those that, for those that don't know, do you want to describe what those changes were, or do you want me to describe? If if you want to do a good job, I mean, you're more than welcome. You probably know a little bit more than me. I just don't want to put you on the spot. I'm sure you would do fine if you want to give, <laughs> a, give it a shot. If you want, if not, I'll do it. Yeah, uh, for. However long, 15 years, uh, the markets worked one way, and then CCP decided to change how the sales tax and broker's fees would be calculated, um, and they also changed the amount, what is it, the number rounding? Yeah. The amount yeah. of decimal points. And the, and the skills that uh, impacted them as well. So 
Mar- yeah, margin of, trading. The margin trading, they really impacted all around. Well, the big change the big change was that you used to be able to change an order. If I put something up for a million ISK, I could say, well, a million ISK plus one cent. And then somebody else, and, and the fee actually wouldn't be very much because uh, it was based on a certain calculation of how much did you change that order. If you actually dropped the price, you didn't actually pay much in fees. But if you raise the price, then the market would ask you to pay a certain amount in fees. Um, But they changed it so that instead of it being a a small fee, first of all, you couldn't do the one cent change anymore. Because what people would do is day trade, right? Like I would put down something for a million and Abby would put down something, but he wanted to be on top of me. So he put it down for a million uh, plus one cent. And uh, then Rundle comes around and he's like a million plus two cents. And so we're all basically... Well, Rundle would come in and do one million less a cent because I actually want yeah, mine I ahead. I yeah, was doing it so it'd be easier to. Yeah, you're right. But it was. Yeah, it but would be you're going trying down. to get the lowest price, but I only want to drop my price by point by a penny. So if you're a million, I'm at nine hundred nine 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 dot nine nine, and now I'm the top one because most people should be sorting by lowest price. Right, right. They're trying to get the best they, deal, so they're buying right. it the cheapest. And now you're one cent cheaper than I, uh, than Abby, and Abby's one cent cheaper than me. And the point is that we're day trading, right? We're we're jumping on top of each other, and that was actually a game style that people would do. They'd sit there and they'd change their orders, or they'd come in and change their orders. Actually, very regular. Other types of investment are much slower, where people put something at. Uh, 1 million and they walk away for two months and they don't care if somebody jumps ahead of them or not. They're just wanting to put it there because they think that's the right price for that product and they walk away. And uh, and that's long-term trading. So what CCP decided to do was to say, yeah, you can't change it by one cent anymore. In fact, you have to change it by a certain decimal place depending on the size of the order. So if it's a billion that you're talking about, you have to change it in the hundreds of millions or the tens of millions. And uh, so, you know, if you're going to change your order, you have to go up or down by 10 million. And so the fee associated with that is much greater than it used to be. And that's why you see a massive jumps. The other thing this does, first of all, it collects a lot more money for the, for the empires, which is money basically funneled out of the game. So that's a drain of ISK. And that jumps up. That's what you're seeing in red there. But the other psychological thing it does is it makes somebody pick the right price point for a product the first time they put it in because they don't want to incur fees for moving it around. They don't want to play the market in a rapid way. They want to put it in where it's supposed to be and leave it there and wait. Uh, So trading slowed way down. The day trading profession was destroyed because you would just lose money. And uh, what was born is more investing. So people will buy and trade where they think something is, is worthwhile. The day traders now do still come around, but what they do is they'll break an order of, ten, uh, of 1,000 things into five orders of 200, basically. And then they're more maneuverable to, to stay competitive. Um, that's kind of how they still work. Anyway, that's what that... That's why that uh, red line jumps up because you're having to pay a lot more, pay a whole lot more to maneuver your items up or down on the market. Yeah, one thing um, this did that was annoying for me was because this number for, you know, almost 20 years was very steady, very reliable. You could use it to almost estimate how much total market trading was happening because of these changes uh and it changed people's play style it changed trading for a few months as people adapted to it um it's kind of made it a little bit more difficult uh in trying to figure out what is the real or average number of this right where will this naturally settle in time um as people learn to not update orders so often pick a price let it sit there for two or three months see what happens with it Mm -hmm. i actually I, i really like it I like it too, actually. Now it rewards. The gameplay isn't, are you at your computer uh, running? There was rumors there were bots, but we could never prove any of that. But uh, let's put all that aside. Let's say there were no bots. There are still people who are sitting there playing the active game, constantly jumping up on top of you. Most of the time, not a problem because nobody's going to sit there and do that for equipment normally. But what they would do that for is Plex. What they would do that for are injectors. And so that was the fast moving stuff. 
But what I like about it is it really rewards research and it rewards um, basically the, the longer term investors, the people that know what a good price for a thing is, and uh, also people who can predict uh, where something is going to go in the long term. So for those types of people, it's a little more steady, it's a little slower, but more deliberate uh, financial gameplay. Absolutely, and uh, these changes also up the, uh, also uh, led to the um, you know the TTT situation, right? As CCP took more ISK and tax out of the game, yeah, um, yeah, they, the players. I think they taxed NPCs. They raised the taxes for NPCs uh, quite a bit. So if you're buying stuff on Jita, it's actually costing you more, and that was a boon for TTT. That was before this market change, but it was. Yeah, it was a boon. I can't remember, Abby, if there was if if the change in relisting fees helped player markets very much. Do you know? I can't remember. No, sorry, I think you're right. Yeah, I think it's actually more the initial broker's fee and sales tax and not the relisting fee. Yeah. Well that came that came pretty close too. The relisting fee happened in two thousand nineteen. Uh, sorry, the tax hike came in the summer of 2019, just a few months before I think they actually changed the way you did the relisting fees. So, um, yeah, they kind of came at the same time. All right, thanks for the cheer, guys. Um, but I think the thing that's exciting here is the Silk Road, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, like, I, I wanted this to be the case. I was kind of, you know, I, I, first of all, you know, I just want to let my bias show. I was kind of hoping this would be the case, but <laughs> I, I also didn't expect it to be. I really thought trade would concentrate in Jita. On that market trade, uh, if you scroll to the bottom left of the tab you're on, the you'll see left, those percentages. Yeah. Yeah. These ones we were talking about earlier. So this is uh, the market value percentages uh, of trade that's happening in these in these regions. And as we can see, in January 2019, you know, the forge was 85 to 90 percent, right? That's 87 percent. Yep, 87 percent. And it's a steady 87, 85, 86. Like, that's, that's the number it's at, high 80s. Yeah, and it stays there, steady. And as you can see, domain stays steady, 7 percent. Same with Sync Liaison. These are all steady numbers. And as we scroll down towards the end... We get to this uh, August. So that first month, right? So that's when the invasion started. Yep. 3% drop. And up until October, when the systems were finally taken into that uh, Triglavian uh, region of Pashvan. That was like late September, early October. And the uh, trading has dropped in the Forge region. Trading is up in the main. Trading is up as a sync liaison. Um, it's a bit early to tell yet, but I mean, the last kind of, I'd say, six months have been good indicators. Yeah. That this uh, this is definitely happening. People yeah, are like not... 5% for sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and a 5% drop in the Jita is, is nothing, right? That's a drop in the bucket, but that's a lot of ISK spread out in those other systems, those other trade hubs. Yeah, the uh, the change in market share is actually astounding at five percent, and it's and it's the trend is that it's going to keep going in that direction as regionality of marketplaces starts to become more and more favored. That's incredibly exciting. We knew that theoretically it should happen, but when we were looking at the MER, we couldn't really see it happening. Uh, somebody smarter than me, at least Randolph, was saying, "Yeah, it's happening in Amar." Uh, it's definitely happening in Amar, but I couldn't see it. Other people couldn't see it and uh, until Abby went and did some number crunching. So it's not yep, just that... Amar, but it's also Dodixie and Hack and Renz as well. They're all benefiting from the Silk Road. And yeah, and I think this kind of links into the show the other day with the mining crew. You know, mining has blown up in Minmatar space, right? You guys were covering that? Yeah. Yeah, we were. It's an exciting place right now. Over the last few episodes, not just the Dam Fam group that's uh, over there in uh, Damlin, uh, 
uh, near Rennes, but also just in general, you have Arcia re- leading a lot of fleets uh, in that area. There's just there's something exciting going on in that area. Yeah, so I think it makes sense. People are spreading out. Maybe people are spreading closer to low sec as well. Um, you know, for those good bounties and that good that good ore, and then you're just taking the ore to the local trade hub instead of all the way to Jita because you want to get back out there mining or ratting. So here's an opportunity to theory craft for a moment, you know, back to Matterall's beginning of what we do here, kind of throw some ideas around. Big so tank. what else? Yeah, the big thing tank. So, okay, that's 5% out of Jita spread across. What would the next thing uh, would need to happen to push another 5% or another 10% out of Jita? What kind of mechanic or what kind of event do you think would do that? Well, this might be a trend, so it might just naturally happen. All right, might might continue going. Um, yeah, I'll I, answer my own question. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, a <laughs> little more um, some form of automated transport up between market to market. Now, you, you know, you, they'd have to do that properly so that you don't screw on freighters and all that other stuff. But you know, what if? for a a skill or some fee or something where you could um, put 50% or uh, a bigger number, 80% of what you want in Jita and 20% of whatever you want to put would be sent to a secondary market. So if you created the secondary market ability, so you still, it would force automatically, whatever it is you're going to put in Jita automatically has to go somewhere else. And there's a bit of a fee associated with that. So it automatically forces products to these other markets. Um, I think that might, you know, why would you move stuff around? Well, you avoid the fee. That's what's, you know, but these mm-hmm. big trades, the people are like, ah, I'm always going to Jita. Well, now you're forcing material to other markets. Um, that, that was my thought in my head. I think we were also thinking like, how do we help this along? How do we diversify where people go to buy their stuff? And one of the big problems, you know, whenever you do a multi-buy of multiple ships or something, if it's really frustrating to to basically not have the, say, damage control module that you need for that fit. But when you're in Jita, everything's there. So, you you know, the, the, the buy all or, or multi-buy works really well. It just doesn't seem to work well in places that don't have things. So as orders get filled for non-typical things, you start getting a more robust ecology to purchasing and stuff. Uh, I think that might help. But there's a lot of pressures against that, like a limit of trade orders. Even if you have max skills, you can only have 512 uh, trade orders or something. I may be wrong about that number. It's been a while. Uh, But uh, then there's the... You know the sourcing. Uh, the sourcing might not be the problem. It's just uh, the frequency of purchasing and stuff. You have to have almost like a confidence that Amar is going to have everything you need to want to go shop there. That's why right. everybody goes to Jita because they know everything. Everything they need is going to be there at that marketplace. Um, but that's not true for Dodixie. It's not true for Heck or Renz, even less, or, or even Amar. Amar a lot of times won't have everything that you need, so it can be frustrating. There's some good. Uh, there's some good counter comments in the audience. Um, mm-hmm. Specifically, uh, I'm going to screw this name. Uh, Abyssidus. Um, you know, about space truckers having it hard enough, making it more attractive to use them. So, okay, so take my same concept, where you put the big order up for sale in in uh, in Jita, and you ha- are forced to take some of your amount and have it shipped, and it's open contracts. And uh, space truckers can pick it up and take it to the required one automatically. It's just part of it happens. Um, and there's always work there. There's always product to move. There's always another way to get paid. Now, you'd have to make it safe for them. And there's that whole second part of how safe should it be to move product around. But, um, you know, that's that would legitimize the career, right? There's always a constant steady flow of product to move from Jita to the other main hubs, and it automatically happens, and you can just space truck all day long. Yeah, and uh, the problem with, there are groups that will move stuff for you. Most of those groups, I I don't know if this is true. We should actually interview them again, but uh, we're talking about like Black Frog or Red Frog, Freighting, also X, 
Push X. Push X. Thank you. Oh my God. Push X. Yeah, those guys are great. Um, those two groups, you know, will move stuff for you. They have websites that you can just contract your stuff for them. It has they they have certain guidelines, but you uh, fill all that in, and, and the stuff what you know ends up in a few days where you wanted it. Um, but normally, I, and I don't know how well they do, or I don't know who actually uses them. Is it industrialists that are building things that need supply lines, or is it, uh, you know? individuals that want to go into deep space uh, and, and, and fight. Uh, but we should find out. Most people, though, have alts, right? Like if you're a warrior, you're probably going to have an alt that can get your supplies and buy your stuff and then truck it over to where you need it. So I don't yeah. know. I don't know that diversity. Like do, do, do people want to rely on somebody else for a fee? Or do they feel like they're saving money by spending their time with an alt? It's a tricky one. I, I definitely think if you have, you know, four or five characters or accounts or alts, you're going to end up training one into hauling your stuff. It's, it's, it's inevitability. Yeah. yeah. And But if you're a one or two, you know, if you're one guy, one character, one account, or maybe just two, you'll definitely use uh, the hauling services. Well, if you're in a corp too, I mean, when I was in NC Dot, they'd always say like, "I'm doing a run to Jita. Who needs anything? Just make me a list." That's right, yeah. You know, so a lot of people help each other out without, you know, people would then tip. You know, it's just kind of a courtesy to tip your guy in your corp that went and did something. But and people will do that alliance wide. I think, I think better yet, what you'll see is people using Poshfin once they tame it, once they figure out where to get in and where to get out, to cut through, cut down that Silk Road. They might start using that to move stuff from Jita to any one of these other trade hubs uh, to save some time, especially Amar, which is the farthest one away. Not only Poshfin, uh, but also they may use uh, Thera, like you're familiar with that, Abby. Wormholes, yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah, I don't want to give all the secrets away, which are after putting me on the spot now. Oh, sorry, dude. Yeah. Well, nah, nah. <laughs> it's a known thing, but you're it right. is. You're right. Um, and also, low yeah. sec is another area. But well, yeah. If anyone is really interested in moving stuff between Jita and Amara and wants to cut down to fifty jumps, uh, I wouldn't recommend the low sec systems. They're definitely camped now. But uh, the Terra wormhole system, you use uh, the Eve Scout website. They have an in-game bookmark channel. It's really good for running a blockade runner deep space transport uh full of stuff through those systems i mean you'll definitely yeah. get killed at times but uh it's definitely worth the time saved well the or, the, the trade-off is uh you can uh, you can basically accept some amount of danger and setback if you get destroyed if you save time or you can spend the time and have a safer route exactly yeah. although I'll tell you this, it's not that safe. If you're going to be hauling away from your character, like just do an autopilot type hauling for 30 jumps, it's going to take a long time, but you're going to get killed if you don't have the right standing. You need to have a little bit of Triglavian standing and a little bit of Edencom standing, or actually just Triglavian standing, so that the, the uh, NPC Triglavians that might appear on the way uh, to your destination won't trap you and kill you because that is happening all over the place it's very dangerous for haulers that don't have a little bit of standing towards triglavians absolutely and they're uh, they're more in caldari space so they're more likely to appear near jita um right when you think you're there and safe yeah so uh the triglavians will appear within three systems of any poshvin system that was kidnapped most of those were in uh caldari space so there's more areas where those rats are kind of floating around empire space a lot less so in uh Hamatar and metropolis the minmatar space because minmatar defended their area very well thank you arcia and so uh, i think that's one of the reasons you're seeing a resurgence of people wanting to mine and move and do industry in uh minmatar space that might be one of the secrets yeah, I, I think I absolutely have to agree with you there. I think if I was uh, wanting to mine quietly and nibble on some rocks, I'd get as far away from Triglavians as possible. <laughs> nibble on some rocks. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, that's cool. And I'm so appreciative that you're putting some evidence on the uh, 
what we thought would happen because I wasn't seeing it happen. I was like, well, maybe we're just wrong about this. But the Silk Road is real. All the trade hubs from Jita at the top to Amar at the bottom and all the three in between as it snakes through. And I love that graphic. Let's look at that again. And here it is actually on the map. You know, the Silk Road think? is real. I love it. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Again, I mean, I, I thought I'd be wrong, and I thought I'd end up proving that it wasn't, so I'm kind of glad that it ended up being being there and being real. We're seeing some effect in the market anyway, and hopefully uh, I'll continue to track it for time to come, and we'll see a growth in the other regions. All right. Thanks, Abby. No worries. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's uh, all we have time for today. I want to remind you that there are several Fortizars going down. Uh, Pappy is taking some stuff out. Imperium is uh, sitting in 1DQ defending against uh, people who are uh, messing with their gate camp. So the war goes on. It's in a smoldering phase. I want to say thanks, Rundle. You're welcome. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Abby. Oh, before we go, let's have a little fun okay. with Trash Talk Tuesday yesterday. Let's talk about that yes. show. You were on it. What was it like? Yes. Uh, well, it's a different format. Uh, this is the news here, and there is uh, you get a, a bunch of people together to talk about events and ongoings in uh, both sides. And um, as the name suggests, uh, you know you can be a little direct in your commentary to the other pilot, um, but not too so, direct. Because one guy got but, kicked off, right? Yeah, you get a little too direct, and you know sometimes Redline, uh, who's the host and ru who runs that, as well as the New Eden Post, um, you know, might just say ah, that's a bit too much. And boom, uh, the band hammer hits you. He's gone. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, think, there's sort of a regular crew of people to show up and talk through items. And Yeah. I think my takeaway from that was uh, just how angry Vili is with Dreadbomb because Dreadbomb's doing a lot of um, – I don't know. There's nothing formal between Dreadbomb and Initiative, but – but Dreadbomb really comes from Test, right? The Sado used to be during the winter – legacy war used to be on the legacy side as part of test one of their fcs and did a lot of work for them uh, yeah. went off on his own formed dread bomb and now dread bomb is really being a bit of a menace let's call him a pest to legacy uh, there may not Certainly. be a formal agreement with the initiative and imperium by extension but it certainly is a dark gray area not just a neutral gray area right yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, it's certainly, you know, in, in a bubble, um, legacy people are fighting Dreadbomb. Uh, simple as that. And for whatever reason. And then there's times where you're like, well, if you're not with us, you're against us. And if you're in the against us crowd, then you're all lumped together. I mean, it's just human nature to think that way. But uh, when you pull at the string and try to find out who's really doing what for what reason, that's where a bit of the... That's that really dark gray area, for sure, is what, what's really happening. I, I think there's solid points where they, they were making last night where, you know, I was just there yeah. for a fight. I just, uh, you know, I, there was a, a fleet I was going to engage in. And so what it was on this this location, it, it, you know, so it doesn't matter the way it looked, here was my motivation. Okay, I can give that. But that might not account for every, you know, uh, interaction. So there's certainly got to be other times where ah, I'm going to do these guys a bit of a solid or I'm going to attack whoever I want. Yeah, I think Sado defended himself very well. It sounded yes. very uh, plausible, everything he said. There was one incident where he dropped uh, capitals or maybe even supers where initiative could have taken them and initiative held back. And this is where I think Vili got him saying, you had the confidence to be able to do that. Where does that come from? And I thought that was telling. Right. Like, that's a hard yeah. one to explain. Uh, it, it does. It gets a little gray. A little gray. Yeah. That's the only time I thought Sado didn't have, like, a sufficient answer for that, except uh, he, asked, he asked Pando, are you going to attack me if I drop these things here? And Pando's like, we don't want, we don't care about anybody except Pappy. We're here to kill Pappy. And normally that's like, do I trust that? <laughs> you know? <'Cause, laughs> A kill mail is a kill mail, and but I guess it's it was he had enough confidence that Pando wouldn't do that. Does that speak highly of Pando and his credibility? 
he is a very credible guy or is there some kind of understanding that it's not a dangerous situation because we're kind of damaging the same people so nothing formal but it is a darker gray area than just a neutral gray area i thought that was a very interesting part of the show and there was a lot of uh, anger on both sides really yeah it escalated for sure there yeah, yeah. so uh i you know to wrap that up I, you know for me it's an enjoyable uh an enjoyable place to spend some time on uh, tuesday nights i like the banter um i got a little bit of uh I got a little bit of trash talk myself. I, you know, red line was super nice and put my, he, how he does his shows. He has just the avatars of the players. And he was super nice. Got my avatar already after all this time, after I'd kind of been boohoo and crying, he was going to do his, And I, I unfortunately was here helping out you. And then I showed up a little late and he had scratched me off and put a big red X through me at one point and completely <laughs> booted me off the screen. So I had to kind of take it on the chin, but it was all right. It was oh, all good. I'm sorry. That's your day job, man. This is just your moonlight. <laughs> Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. That's well, all right. I we, deserved it. But we like talking to you, so we like having you here. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Outcast Army says now he's off to go watch uh, the Trash Talk Tuesday. Uh, it, it gets rough. Uh, so if, you know, if it's not your thing, be careful. Uh, but uh, enjoy it. And uh, thank you guys all for coming around and uh, watching our show today. We'll be back tomorrow with more Talking In Stations. Uh, until then, take care. We'll try to find you a ray. Thank you.